Bon dia. Bon dia a tothom. Professor Fer, willkommen a la Universitat Pompeu Fabra. Mi junge un mes per aquí a la Universitat. I es veu repetir en anglès, oi? On behalf of the rector, I welcome you to the 26th opening lecture in UPF Economics and Business. I want to excuse the rector for not being here for major reasons has impeded him to be here. Let me introduce the table. On my right, I have our distinguished guest today, Professor Hans Fer from UBS International Center of Economics and Society and University of Zurich. The title of the lecture looks exciting, and I'm sure uh, we'll have a good time here. He will speak about one of these black boxes, preferences. I think this is interesting for both economics and business. Two sides on my left, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Jose uh, Urbieta, CFO of Laboratories Dr. Esteve. Uh, this is our sponsor. I thank Laboratories Dr. Esteve for sponsoring this lecture uninterruptedly over all these years. Some of these years have been quite difficult years recently, but this sponsorship has been here always. And right on my left, I have Professor Rosemary Nagel, who will introduce our lecturer today. So let me continue now a couple of minutes in Catalan for the audience. Bé, aquesta és la meva primera lliçó inaugural com a degà. És un plaer per mi estar aquí. Aquesta banda de l'auditori, havia estat molts cops de l'altra banda de l'auditori. És un esdeveniment molt important per al nostre centre, pel nostre departament i facultat d'economia i empresa. S'està celebrant sense interrupció des de l'any 1990 i per aquí han passat conferenciants molt destacats en economia i empresa. Voldria agrair en primer lloc al professor Vicent Ortún, que va ocupar aquest lloc com a degà els últims cinc anys. Jo crec que tots els estudiants, els professors, el personal d'administració i serveis estem agraïts a la seva dedicació i al seu esforç com a degà. Ells i anteriors degans han contribuït a crear un programa docent realment envejable i realment un desafiament pel que es posi en el meu càrrec. Els nostres graus, com sabeu, es valoren com a primers en molts rànquings. Hi ha molta demanda, la nota de tall, els nostres graus creix any rere any. I és tan difícil entrar a alguns dels nostres graus com entrar a medicina, que sempre es diu que és molt difícil entrar a medicina, però els nostres graus és tan difícil entrar com a medicina. Podem oferir fins a quasi 900 pràctiques remunerades a empreses, més de 300 intercanvis internacionals, tants estudiants que venen cap aquí com que van cap a fora, amb tot el valor que això significa. I tot i així, doncs, és un moment per continuar plantejant-se rectes, no? Jo, com a assumint un càrrec nou, sempre diu, a veure, què hem de fer, com ho hem d'assumir? Hem complert 25 anys com a UPF i també aquest centre, aquesta facultat. I, per tant, entrem en el 26è any i potser, doncs, sortim de la joventut i anem a la maduresa. Doncs, com ho hem de fer, no? Tenim reptes molt importants. Jo crec que els valors i la missió d'aquesta escola ha estat sempre la mateixa. Promoure el talent i utilitzar els recursos que disposem de la millor manera possible. Jo ho definiria o ho resumiria així. I això sempre es dic que els meus estudiants, quan ocupen el seu lloc d'estudi, és una mena de miracle. És una universitat pública i que ofereix docència amb els professors més destacats a nivell mundial en les seves àrees a professors associats destacats en les seves àrees professionals, una formació multilingüe, no sé, és realment molt bo que es puguem oferir això. Promoure el talent i rebre els millors estudiants és un desafiament i volem assumir-lo. I volem estudiants dedicats al treball acadèmic, que estiguin per aquí, que nosaltres podem oferir-los el millor coneixement de primera línia, de frontera, que puguin, a més, participar en tota mena d'iniciatives, associacions, les que siguin, i que realment creïn un ambient en el qual podem sentir-nos com una comunitat que estem tots batallant pel mateix. Jo crec que la societat jutja i valora la Pompeu, sempre es pensa que és una mica especial, però això s'ha de treballar. Nosaltres crec que ens beneficiem tots d'això, els estudiants principalment, que es pensi que aquí és un centre una mica especial. Però això ho hem de continuar treballant 
amb exigència, rigor, jo crec que també ens aprofitem tots que la valoració que tingui la societat de la Pompeu sigui que és un centre en què es treballa i es treballa molt bé i dur. Els mètodes docents han de ser innovadors també. Professorat de primera línia, com deia, produint recerca de primer nivell internacional i professors associats destacats en els seus àmbits professionals. Personal de suport també de primera línia, tant a biblioteca com a informàtica, com al propi professorat de suport a la docència. Jo crec que tenim personal immillorable. Però tot això, doncs, jo crec que estem en un punt realment bo, però tenim molta feina per endavant i realment l'hem de sumir. Partim d'unes condicions inicials molt bones, jo crec, per fer-les. Bé, ara voldria introduir, presentar el professor Ros Marinagel. El professor Ros Marinagel will introduce our lecturer today, and at the end she will also chair the round of questions. So, remember, you have to do that too. Okay, professor Nagel, the floor is yours. Okay, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Ernst Fair. Ernst Fair is an experimental and behavioral uh, economist like me, and actually we, um, he is a, um, one of the most famous experimenters, and he has won many prizes. He has positions in NYU, um, and I mean, there's so much to tell that I thought I pick one um, area, and that is, I want to tell you in what areas in experimental economics and what he does with experiments and behavioral economics in very different areas from a very interdisciplinary perspective. So we met um, 20 years ago when our field was basically small and unknown. We all knew each other. Um, I was a young um, um, assistant professor or postdoc, and uh, Ernst Fair actually as all the people of his generation was started out, out as a theorist. And then with his paper on labor contracts about the question of efficiency wages, he was told, well, why don't you also test this? And he said, well, I can test this. I can test that with an experiment. And that's basically how he started his career as an experimenter. Yeah, as many other, others of his colleagues who were real theorists and started experiments. So he used, for many years, lab experiments. And so in the 90s, we had a great um, uh, data set of experiments, and the big dispute was, is game theory right or wrong? And there were those who said, game theory is wrong, and it's clear from the data, and with the same data, the theorists said, the theory is right. And then, in the, at the end of the 90s, Ernst Fair, together with Klaus Schmidt, ingeniously found a way to show how the theory can, in fact, be right. And this is done with uh, incorporating social preferences in the utility function. And you, as uh, uh, first-year students, have all basically heard about this with maybe without the name, because you have studied the ultimatum game. You have studied the ultimatum game with first with behavior, so in online, and then you studied the theory. So the subgame perfect equilibrium says you should give nothing, but you will get, get something as a s responder, and this can be reconciled with the theory of social preferences, that you will not be so greedy and give nothing to the others, and you will really, as a responder, be not accepting everything. But uh, Ernst did not stop with just doing experiments. He thought maybe humans have a brain, and this brain also um, uh, decides how we do our decisions. And therefore, he went to the field of, uh, which is now called, or he started the field with others, which is called neuroeconomics, and he actually published this book, which you can get on amatazot.com. And there you bring together the brain with money. Yeah? And in order to bring to, together the brain with money, you need also machinery, very expensive machinery. Yeah? And you put people in a scanner, which you might know from the movies, and there you can actually bring together decision-making together with biological data. And you can have many other possibilities to bring basically biology together with decision-making. Decision so this has been started at the end of the 90s and uh, um, beginning of uh, 2000. It's still a fringy um, subject as experimental economics was a fringy subject, but Ernst did not stop there. He thought, 
the brain, well, that's still not the basis of everything. Let's go deeper. And he went to genome economics and he looked at the genes. Well, he's a little bit stuck there. Um, uh, he told us just that um, he started this project in 2007 uh, or 8, and even with somebody from biology he, um, here in our university. But the problem is that now um, everything gets more expensive and everything gets also more data. You have, instead of 20 million bits, with, um, um, not bits, um, in the uh, in the in the in the brain, um, what is it called? Uh, neurons. You have now one million snipes. Yeah. So the data analysis is almost impossible. I mean, our typical data analysis. Yeah. And so well, he's still stuck in there. But there is more to come. Um, that is, the big question is, what does this all mean? And to go into the brain and to be only stuck in the lab there is the question of external validity. And here the question is, well, how can we transport all our findings in, in the field? And it's very simple. We just have similar questions. And we now go on the street. Or Ernst went to Africa. And there he has now a science paper, which you can immediately download. Ah, yeah, right. Um, uh, he has a, uh, a very interesting science paper where he also applies, uh, comes to policy application. I mean, I cannot tell everything, and I will probably give Ernst Fair now the world. And <laughs> but you can uh, download it, and you should download it maybe after the talk. <laughs> okay, that was my Instagram introduction of Ernst Fair. Thank you, Professor Nagel. So uh, now. So for the floor is yours. Microphone. <laughs> so thanks a lot for uh, telling the people the portfolio of my activities. So it's not a straight line. So I'm still doing everything. <laughs> so, and this is what you have to do when you are a scientist. You have to have a portfolio of projects. So some, some materialize and become successful and others don't. And that's just a simple truth about risk taking, so to speak. Scientific endeavors are risky, and that's uh, why it's sometimes wise to have m many different acts in, in your portfolio. Now, uh, what I'm doing today is I'm giving a talk on the Gustibus Estis Potandum, and some of you may know that uh, almost 40 years ago there was a famous paper published by by Stigler and Becker, two famous Chicago economists with the title De Gustibus non est disputandum. You can't quarrel about tastes, and that's what, when I grew up uh, in academia, what I learned. So teacher usually writes a utility function on the blackboard or on the PowerPoint slide these days, and, and that's the function uh, that's assumed to be maximized and it's given. And if you ask where it comes from, we make the, we s I mean, we have nothing to say basically where it comes from. It's an assumption. We, we assume plausible uh, preferences and, and then we do our analysis. Now I found this always uh, a bit unsatisfactory because I thought uh, they have to come from somewhere and uh, uh, we should study that. But at the same time, I, we didn't have the tools to study them. We, we didn't know how to measure them. We didn't know how to infer, uh, to, to really prove that something has a causal impact on, on preferences. We didn't have the, uh, the empirical tools to study causality. So we, we lacked basically all the ingredients to study uh, preferences. And what I'm going today is I'm showing you that we have now all the ingredients so we can start. And this is why I call this, this the emerging science of preference formation. Uh, and uh, I give you a short outline at the beginning what I'm going to do. Uh, I will first uh, talk a little bit about the stable preference assumption in economics, how sociologists view this, how economists view this, and then I, I ask the question, how sound is the economist's viewpoint? And when I say economists, you see we are not uh, 
monolithic community, but there is a prevailing view. So there's always heterogeneity, fortunately, and it's through heterogeneity uh, progress occurs because some things that were deemed unimportant suddenly become important because somebody can show that it is important. Okay, so I, I talk about this initially, and then I give you just examples from my own research, and if I have time also, I give you an example from somebody else's research. And I ask the question uh, whether aggregate asset prices affect risk preferences. This is typically ruled out in finance models. Uh, uh, then the next question I ask is, does business culture in banking affect preferences for honesty? A pretty important question also. And then I ask uh, another question which is uh, um, inspired by, by the nuclear catastrophe in Chernobyl, namely whether such nuclear catastrophes have an effect on, on people's preferences. And the final question here is, which excites me a lot, is whether we can deliberately shape people's preferences or our children's preferences, for example. So is it possible to make a, a human being more or less pro-social, more or less prone to take risk, more or less impatient? Well, I give you my prejudice. Yes, I believe it's possible, but we know next to nothing whether and how and so on. And, but it has tremendous implications for educational policy and, and, and it has broad implications if you can shape human personality, the deep parameters of human personalities that opens up a whole new avenue of research and also, of, of course, of ethical questions. So now let me start uh, with a few remarks on the assumption of preference stability. Uh, when I started my research some five or six years ago, uh, I wrote an email to one of my friends from sociology and I thought, well, sociology, I remember from, from my own studies, uh, when I studied economics, I had to take so a sociology course. <laughs> and, and, and when I took that course, it was uh, clear that they, and that was uh, what I remembered, it was clear that they assumed that somehow society shapes the individual, okay? This is, the individual is not a, a blank slate. I mean, it's, it's shaped by, by social forces. But, and then I thought, well, let's send an email and start. Don't replicate things, uh, what they have already solved. Maybe they have already solved this problem partially, so let's start where they have been gone so far. And I asked him, can you give me literature about the the insights that are, have been acquired in sociology about how society shapes individuals' preferences. And here is the answer he gave me. Now this is no longer, uh, here it is. So here is a quotation. I like this quotation very much. It's, it's, it's beautiful, I think. So the assumption that society shapes individuals' preferences clearly concerns one of the core pillars of sociology, but it is not easy to suggest any literature to you. It's almost too fundamental for that, like asking economists to suggest some tests on the importance of choice. Almost all sociologists take it as obvious that individuals' preferences are formed by society and that society, so to speak, exists within persons, but we just assume that, basically, he's saying, and we don't know anything about it. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's a science here that assumes something and it's taken for granted, but uh, doesn't deliver theories or evidence on it. It's just an axiom, basically, taken as an axiomatic departure. Now, let me contrast this with the famous Becker and Stigler view in economics, which was written down in De Gustibus Nones Disputandum, where they write, tastes neither change capriciously nor differ importantly between people. On this interpretation, one does not argue about tastes for the same reason one does not argue over the Rocky Mountains. Both are there, will be there next year too, and are the same to all men. Pretty strong statement. <laughs> so, and a note, uh, uh, well, Becker, these guys were known for a clear language, and, uh, and this is clear language. They are like the Rocky Mountains. They are there in 100 years, and in 1,000 years, they are there like the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and uh, notice they assume that it's not, they not just assume preference stability, they assume basically homogeneity. They assume uh, it's all the same, okay? Now, we know in the meantime, there has been a lot of research on preferences uh, that uh, 
that uh, uh, this is not true, that preferences are, are the same to all men. I mean, we have uh, lots of evidence that preferences, when you look at risk preferences, at time preferences, at social preferences, or just think about your, social, your preferences for chocolate. Some of the people in the room like it and some don't like it. So it's clearly there is preference heterogeneity. Now that's falsified, but, but what about the stability, okay? So preference heterogeneity is falsified. There is now compelling evidence in many, so I self-servingly cite one of my papers, but I could have cited also other papers that there is a lot of preference heterogeneity in all kinds of preference domains. Now, but it's still true that when you study economics, that 95 or even 98% of, of what you do is going through thought experiments or through exercises that assume some form of preference stability. Okay? For example, when you want to investigate what's the impact of tax changes, cost changes, price and information changes. You typically assume a utility function that's given, okay? So all the change, all the action is in the changes in the constraints, in the budget line, uh, in the slope, in where, it's, where it is, and so on. Uh, and, or in the changes in property rights and the contractual uh, environment. Now, uh, there is an implicit assumption here, and one could distinguish between a strong and a weak preference assumption, stability assumption. The, 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 the weakest, the strong assumption says simply like Becker Stigler, they're stable. The weak assumption says they're stable for the problem under consideration. So if I'm looking at how does uh, uh, a, a tax change affect consumption in Spain, then this implicit assumption is they are at least stable for that period that I consider in my analysis, okay? And that is a reasonable assumption. I have, I'm not at all at odds with that assumption that is a very powerful research program and has uh, given us many, many insights. Uh, uh, however, I want to argue today that there are other important phenomena that we leave out of our picture if we assume that preferences, if, if we always assume that preferences are stable, in particular in the long run, but also maybe in the short run. Actually, I show you examples today that preferences can be pretty malleable in the short run even, okay? And, uh, uh, well, Becker Stigler, they, in, in, when you read their paper, which is still worthwhile to read, they say basically, uh, and I have it on my slides, but I went over it too quickly. They basically say if, you, if, if, if people don't know how to explain a phenomenon, then the discussion some often bogs down to uh, assuming some obscure change in preferences, and then that explains uh, uh, the phenomenon, of course. And what they uh, refer to is kind of a lazy attitude, which is... Uh, uh, best illustrated by the following example. Imagine you watch, um, you are at the petrol station and you see a guy uh, drinking a liter of petrol. Now, asking yourself as a social scientist, how can I explain this? Well, your friend tells you it's very easy to explain. He likes petrol. <laughs> <laughs> so, phenomenon explained. Now, here you see the, the, the challenge here. You can explain everything by assuming particular preferences and you have to put some constraints on these ex explanations otherwise if you don't put constraints on the explanation you can explain everything and therefore you have explained nothing and that was traditionally the main uh, criticism of, of, of uh, ta towards, targeted towards people who, who look at uh, preference based explanations. Okay so uh, but let me, my, here are a few remarks from my side on the assumption of preference stability. So first it's important to recognize it's an assumption. It's not a fact. And there are so many things that are assumed in all the sciences, by the way, not just economics. There are so many things that are conventional that you can, if you are a, a kind of a, a risk-taking entrepreneur, you can go against these conventions and Sometimes you, you may be very successful in, in breaking them because they are sometimes just there because they are there. And I'm claiming that this convention now uh, should 
be broken, basically. That, that it can be broken in a, in a productive way with a productive research program. And uh, uh, so it's basically useful practice uh, in, has been in the past and uh, the accusation has been when you try, uh, it's here written down here, one, one can explain everything if one involves changes in preferences and ex explanation. Completely agree with that. I completely agree with it. However, uh, or the, you, other, other people say it's too easy to explain changes in behavior by changes in preferences. This is a bad argument. If something is easy to explain, that should not be an argument against it. Uh, you see, but sometimes you hear this. Uh, in, the, in the end, the only thing that counts is it empirically true. That's the only thing that counts. So if something is easy to explain, well, that's good. So that should not be an argument. But sometimes you hear it in particular from theoretical corners because the people like difficult, like, you see, they like non-obvious explanations. So the distance between the assumptions and the conclusions has to be large to be to, to such that you count as a clever guy. So, uh, so this is, the second argument is really bad, but the first argument is, is, ha has validity, of course. So, now what are the problems with that argument? Here is a problem. The problem is that I'm claiming, and I'm not the only one who claims that, one can explain everything if one involves changes in the environment as an explanation. Now, when did I first encounter this uh, argument? So, I have some papers with my co-author Klaus Schmidt. He's a, uh, a good game theorist, applied game theorist. And when I met him uh, the, f the first time, he once told me, look, give me any real world contract and I will design you an extensive form game such that that contract is optimal given the game. But what does that say? I can explain everything by assuming the right moves, the right set of moves, the right information structure, kind of asymmetric information, and so on. And actually, he's not the only one who did this, uh, who, who has this view uh, that you can explain everything. Without, you can leave preferences untouched. You assume they are constant, but you have so many degrees of freedom that you, in fact, can explain everything. One of the first one who articulated that in a very explicit form is John Sutton. John Sutton was president of the European Economic Association. He's a great applied game theorist, game theorist, also a researcher in the industrial organization, has published many important papers. And he gave his presidential address in 1990. And I still remember it. It was a fascinating talk. And what John Sutton said is the following. Let's quote him. The consequent elaboration, so he, he's, he's commenting on the, on, on the literature industrial organization in the 1980s. The consequent elaboration of a richer class of game theoretic models has been remarkably successful in one respect. Given any form of behavior observed in the market, we are now quite likely to have on hand at least one model which explains it. And notice, explains is in, in quotation marks here. Uh, in the sense of deriving that form of behavior as the outcome of individually rational decisions, new explanations of this kind have been adduced across the entire range of the subject, from predatory pricing to vertical restraints. Our toolkit has been enormously enhanced. And then he goes on and, and characterizes a research program that, that escapes, so to speak, uh, uh, these, these problems. But at the end of his, in the, in the middle of his talk, he makes the following comment. In explaining everything, have we explained nothing? What do these models exclude? So, what I'm saying here is, there is no methodologically superior status of explanations based on stable preferences uh, and assuming uh, uh, so, so to speak, that the action is in the change in the constraints versus the other way around. We have to treat them on a par. They are, there's no methodology, there's not one thing superior to the other. It was just not, we were just not able to, to put constraints in the past. We were, have not been able to put constraints on preference-based explanations such that they lose the arbitrariness. So that is, that is the comment I'm making here. And uh, uh, actually, 
Today we have everything we need. We can measure preferences either in surveys or in, in experiments, behavioral experiments. We have all the causal econometrics we need uh, to, to find the natural experiments that trigger uh, maybe a prefer preference change that, or that we can lets us examine a causal impact of a societal change on preferences. Uh, and we can even uh, design field experiments or lab experiments, as you will see in a minute, that allows us to examine uh, uh, this question. Now, uh, uh, let me go on to my concrete uh, examples that I'm putting forward. Here are my uh, examples. Well, first I advertise this paper. <laughs> this is my programmatic paper I wrote four years ago in the Economic Journal in a special volume. It's called tastes, tastes, and culture, the influence of society on preferences, basically lays out the arguments that I've, uh, uh, plus a little bit more than what I have told you already. And, uh, but what I want to do in the rest of my lecture is I give you, want to give you examples. Here, is, here are the examples. First, I will speak about aggregate asset prices, the extent to which they uh, affect traders' risk preferences, then I talk about banking culture, then I talk about Chernobyl, and finally about whether, how we can change children's prosociality. And the first three are based on my own research. The last one is based on research done by Armin Falk at the University of Bonn, who has conducted a beautiful uh, field experiment uh, where he shows that, uh, yes, indeed, you can basically make children nicer people by uh, treating them appropriately. Uh, okay, so do aggregate asset price movements affect risk preferences? Why is this an important question? Well, here is basically why it's important. Uh, some of you may, may have heard of, of, of Bob Schiller, who he won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, and this is the graph from his Nobel Prize winning paper. And what you see on this graph is uh, the following. You see on each of the graphs two lines. The broken line is what standard economic, th what, what kind of the, the, the prevailing paradigm in finance predicts stock prices to be in the long run. Well, that view assumes that stock, the price of stock is just a discounted present value of dividends that's paid from the stock. And he did the tedious task to compute that historically exposed. And so what he finds is, when you look at this flat line here, the flat broken line, that's what asset prices in the U.S. should have been if they would have been rational. Okay. Now, the actual, what you see is that actual asset prices, they, they, they show huge volatility. They show huge volatility. Uh, and note, this I mean, they, are, they deviate from the broken line sometimes for a decade or more. So this is not just a short-run phenomenon. This is really, f prices are wrong sometimes for, for years. And uh, the question is why. So this question has bothered financial economics now since the paper has been published. There have been many methodological contributions. Did he measure it right and so on? But in the end, uh, I think many commentators have shared the view that stock prices are too, mu too, too volatile to be justified by subsequent dividend payments. That was the question in the paper. And, it, and the Nobel Prize Committee was also convinced that it was a fundamental <laughs> contribution to, to finance and economics. Anyway, so, so why do we see this, this, this huge volatility? Now, there are, of course, nice stories that, that uh, you can, my nice uh, uh, models that exist, models of bubbles that uh, can uh, rationalize uh, volatile stock prices. But the question is whether this is the whole story. And that's the, what we did in this paper, published actually this year in the American Economic Review. So what did we do? Well, if you want to study the impact of a boom or a bust on preferences, you face almost insurmountable obstacles. Why? Because I mean, so many things simultaneously change when asset prices go up. We, the society as a whole, many individuals become richer. Our expectations change. Our expectations about means and variance may change. Uh, and on and on and on. And the same for a bust. So it's, 
it's almost a hopeless exercise to, to, to compute, so to speak, from observed data in the asset market uh, what the underlying preferences are because you have so many unobservables that this is almost hopeless. So we, we chose a different strategy. And our strategy imports a technology from psychology, which is called priming. What is priming? Priming is the activation of certain mental concepts. So I can prime a memory, for example. I can make it salient in your mind. Priming is about making things salient in your mind. Okay? And that's what we did here. So we we rendered booms and busts, booms and busts mentally salient in people's minds. And uh, as you will see, the way we did it keeps everything constant. Their wealth is constant, uh, their beliefs are constant, so everything else is constant. So if they change their behavior in response to our prime, it can't be through a change in constraints. It can only be through a change in preferences. That's the claim, okay? So, uh, and here, the, the, I would argue that if you, even the mere priming, and you will see it's totally innocuous what we did, even the mere priming, if even the mere priming of a boom and bust changes people's risk preferences, how much more likely it is that a real boom or bust, which really gets you in the, your mind is really in the grip of a bust if you have assets and they lose value. How much more likely it is that a real bust will affect your risk preferences? If I can even produce that effect already in the laboratory uh, with a priming technology. Now here is what we did. This is now the you are in the experiment. You see this graph. It looks stupidly simple. <laughs> so it's, a, it's time and asset prices. And after that, we ask a few questions. Imagine you find yourself in a continuing stock market boom. Would you buy or sell particular stocks, invest in gold or other precious metals, uh, deposit part of your assets on your savings account, etc., etc.? We put people in the mindset of a boom. And they're randomly assigned to this condition, the other 50% of the people are put in the mindset of a bust. It's as simple as that. Well, it looks really simple exposed, but you, you've, people forget how much thought it takes to come up with this ex ante. It's like always when the proof is made exposed uh, and, and uh, then it looks simple, but ex you have to, have, so to speak, to come up with this ex, ex ante to uh, to, to say it's just simple. Anyway, so who are the subjects here? The subjects are not students. The subjects are financial market traders. So in Zurich, we have every, day, every year uh, a financial market fair where the most, the newest technologies, um, uh, financial technologies are presented I, uh, in computer technologies in financial markets and so on. And Zurich is a financial center, so we, we get m lots of the, the tens of thousands of people who work in the banking sector who come to this financial fair and they are our subjects. So these are not, so to speak, non-specialists. These are specialists. Okay, now what do we do? After they are primed, they do a simple lot. They, they, they participate in a simple lottery task. They get 200 Swiss francs. They can keep everything in a safe account. That means they, they go home with 200 Swiss francs. Or they, they can invest any of the 200 francs in a risky asset, and the risky asset has a 50% probability of winning per invested Swiss franc 2.5 Swiss francs or zero. So basically what you have here, an expected value uh, of one Swiss franc 25, a 25% return rate uh, on this risky asset, which is pretty high, so you would, actually this is per se an interesting question, why do these guys who earn such a lot of money, you see they, these guys earn 150 plus, I say it's a thousand, uh, or two, three hundred thousand, these guys, if you work in the banking sector, you can earn a lot of money, in Switzerland at least. Uh, so uh, it's, they, they earn a lot of money, so this is peanuts for them, so they basically, you could make the, 
the, the argument, they should put everything in the risky asset, basically, which is not what they do typically, because humans are not uh, as theories sometimes suggest. But the interesting thing here is, do they invest more or less in the boom and or the bust condition? That's the interesting question. And since they are randomly assigned, everything is kept the same. And notice there is another important feature here, the blue, uh, the, the yellow and the red ball. So to make it really clear to the most stupid guy that there's a 50% probability, we had these balls in the box. We covered the box and then some, some subjects after the experiment puts his hand in the box and takes out the ball and it's clear that it's 50%. There's no doubt about that. So you can't say their beliefs are somehow affected by the boom and the bust. They cannot believe that the probability to win is 60% because it's so, so transparent here. And so we control for everything. We control for beliefs in particular, for expectations. So the only channel left, if there is a behavioral change, is preferences, okay? We also have an ambiguity task. I skipped that for reasons of time, uh, and I just show you the, the results. Here are the results. During uh, the, the light bar uh, shows you how much they invest in percent of the 200 in the risky asset and the dark bar is what they, in, in, the, in the boom and the dark bar tells you what they invest in the, in, the, in the bust. So there's a huge difference, it's significant, it's significant in the risk condition, it's significant in the ambiguity condition. So here it is. It seems that risk preferences are affected by the mere priming of a boom or a bust. Now, what's interesting here is uh, what we find is in addition, that, uh, that when, you, when, when, when we prime a boom, or, or let me put it the other way around, when we prime a bust, they're more fearful. We measure self-reported fear. And priming a bust puts them into a kind of an emotional state of fear. The mere priming, imagine what a real bust does. <laughs> uh, and so we, we, we put this fear measure into the regressions and yes, it explains part of the effect, a large part of the effect. So the, our assumption was, well, maybe it's the emotion of fear that's triggered by, by boom and bust, okay? That the emotion of fear varies across the cycle. And, but this fear is, of course, a correlate of our manipulation. It's not a, we cannot causally interpret it. So what we do in addition then is, we conduct another experiment in which we threaten to impose an electrical shock on subjects' hands uh, while they are in a task where they can invest money. And notice the electrical shock is completely unrelated to any financial monetary outcome. It's just a, uh, an emotional trigger that we put them in a state of fear very reliably, you can believe me, because the th shock can occur an any second, every second during the trial. So, and if you had a shock, it can appear again. So it's not that you are freed, okay? So basically, so you are in this state of constant state of fear. And now we, uh, we use every subject as its own control because in some conditions they get a very weak tickling shock. So it's, I mean, if you are in this experiment, you are reminded of the condition in which you are in the weak shock or in the strong threat in the weak threat or the strong threat condition by a reminder shock at the beginning. So you get a reminder shock, you know in which condition you are, okay, when it's strong and when it's weak. And so you are in this state of no fear of fear. And what we find is that people, exogenous fear induces uh, less risk taking. And again, it can, can only be a preference effect because it can't be, it's, it can't affect uh, beliefs, it can't affect all these other multitude of factors that could be prevalent in a, in a real world market. Now you might say, well, uh, maybe these were the, the youngsters among the financial traders, the real, really the real uh, experienced guys, they would not behave like that. Well, it's exactly the other way around. The more you have experience in financial market trading, the more you are prone to this effect. <laughs> we have also questionnaires where we ask uh, your financial expertise, so how, how much do you understand about financial markets? The more you understand about financial markets, the more, if anything, you are prone to this effect. So it, you can't say these are just uh, 
people who don't understand what they're doing. Apparently they are, uh, I mean the effect is not really big, the difference, and it's not even significant, but if anything it goes in the wrong direction, you see. You can't argue it's, it's the inexperienced people who underst don't understand how markets work. No, it's the experienced people who understand how these markets work who are prone to this effect. So this is my first indication where I think there's an important feedback loop from, an, from a societal phenomenon, aggregate asset prices, two preferences that, and it's easy to see that in the boom, if I become less risk taking, uh, less risk averse, then I take more risks, okay? So it amplifies, it amplifies the cycle and the same in the bust. Okay, this is the first example. Second example is uh, the following, does business culture affect bank employees' honesty? Uh, we all know there have been lots of banking scandals uh, the, the collective fines that have been paid by the banking industry go into the multiple billions, even for single banks. For example, if you take Citibank over 201 to 2015, it's probably in the range of 20 billion in total. If you take UBS, if you take Credit Suisse, if you take other banks, if you take JP Morgan, you have lot, all of these banks had occurrences where uh, scandals broke out, libel scandals, foreign exchange trend scandal, tax evasion, blah, blah, blah. We all know it. So, and, and that led to the, uh, to, to, uh, to the, well, here you see Jerome Carviel who created a loss for Societe Gener General of, through on our authorized trading uh, for, uh, for about 5 billion euros. And when he was asked why he did it, he said, well, the culture of the trading room was to make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, and so they, I mean, you could say, well, th this guy has every reason uh, to say this, <laughs> uh, to excuse himself, but many other people say this too. You see, it's not just those who, 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 who finally go into prison who say this. And so, so even the economist who is not known to be a left-wing journal, uh, uh, has a, has a uh, story about the rotten heart of finance in 2012. So there are many commentators who think there is something wrong in the, with the business culture in the industry. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we thought, uh, let's test it. And it's an important question because if business culture, now the question is what is business culture? Okay, what I mean with business culture is these informal, unwritten rules. It could also be formal rules, but the informal rules are typically much more important. These informal, unwritten rules that guide people's behaviors throughout their everyday, throughout their work days. And preferences are part of that culture, okay? They are not the only thing. Beliefs about how others behave are also part of the culture, of course. So it's preferences and beliefs. It's, and, and, and the concept of social norms is a, is a complex concept, it all plays a role. Uh, and so what, but we were interested in the role of business culture in, in honesty. To what extent uh, is business culture, has business culture an impact on, on the honesty of, of bankers? And so we had, uh, we, we know many, many people who are in the banking industry, in Switzerland, outside Switzerland. We have many contacts to German, to, uh, to uh, US banks, so we never make clear where we did this study, but we had access. So the interesting thing is you, you get access. The banks are pretty, they want to solve the problem, you see. They're not just the bad guys, they want to solve the problem. And solving the problem means wiping out these cases. And so they gave us access to their own employees such that we could run an experiment because they were interested in what's, what's happening in their company. And, uh, and so what, how, how we did this? Well, the, the research design here is built on, on, a, on, on work by Akalov and Crenton who have this idea that each, each of us basically fills out different social roles. Actually, that's a very sociological concept. So as a family father, different norms may apply compared to when you are in your soccer club, compared to when you are among friends, uh, compared to when you are among your work colleagues. And, and so basically because different kinds of preferences are associated with these different roles, uh, it may be possible to trigger these roles through priming 
and then you may be able to, 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 to have an impact on people's behavior. So what we did here is we just primed professional identity in bankers. So these are all banking employees. Half of them is, is, is assigned to the professional identity prime and half of them is assigned to the, to the leisure prime. And again, when you see the prime, you think it's totally, it's so innocuous. You can't believe that it has an effect, okay? So here is the, here is the prime, banker identity prime. We tell them, well, this is a, a, a uh, a survey on, on XY, I forgot what, it, what we told them. But then we have this innocuous question, set of questions that primes their professional identity. For, we ask at which, in which industry do you work, at which bank do you work, what is your function in this bank, how many years have you been working in this bank. We just make it salient that you are a bank employee. And in the other situation, we make it, we make it salient, uh, we ask you about your leisure activities. So it's your private identity and your banker identity, so to speak, that is primed. And now the question is, do you behave differently after such a prime? And uh, before I tell you what, we, what the behavioral task, let me tell you a little bit about how do we check that we prime the professional identity. Because, I mean, it's, it's our assumption that we prime this, but you have to prove it. In order to publish your paper, you have to prove it. You have to, the word in psychology is you have to do a manipulation check. And that's what we did. And here is our manipulation check. They do a word completion task. The word was ock and you can complete it with stock or clock. Or ochre is broker versus smoker. Money versus honey. <laughs> so it's, it's fun. It's a very nice, ta nice word completion task. And uh, believe it or not, what we find is if we prime the bank, banker's professional identity, they say more often stock and broker and money and bond, okay, the subjects. And so we know, yes, we, we, we did prime the, the professional identity, okay. And so uh, then the question is how do we measure their honesty? And there's a, there's a beautifully simple game available to measure honesty. You can basically play that game at every dinner conversation, in a sense, when you have somebody who helps you. Uh, in our case, it was, you can do it with rolling a die, you see why, but uh, in our case, it was a little bit different. So they had to, to throw a coin 10 times. And when heads comes up, they get $20. And when heads does not come up, they get nothing. Who observes what they throw? Nobody. So what's your incentive? If you throw 10 times a, a coin? OK, so basically, you have an individual incentive to lie. But in the aggregate, I know what the aggregate outcome is if the population is honest. So and I can. Under very mild assumptions, I basically can compute the rate of the, the, the fraction of individuals who lied, and I com can, can, can compute the lying rate. Okay, so it's very very nice paradigm because it has this gray zone, you, and you you can do ten times. You see, when, well, only four. Ah, let's say six. Okay, so so the temptation is is, is here to to lie, and. And we, we play this game, actually we played this game, uh, not me, so my co-authors on this paper. Uh, they played this game also in a prison with prisoners. And what they find is the more the prisoners lie, the more severe is their crime for which they have, are incarcerated. Uh, this game has been played in, in, in India with other people where they are able to measure to what extent milk traders cheat you. In India, you see they, they put water into the milk so that they, they can sell more milk. Uh, and what they find is the more they cheat in the game, the more they cheat their customers. So the, the task really has external validity from several other studies. Okay? And so we did it with, with our bankers. Half of them were primed leisure, half of them were primed uh, with a banker prime. And and here is, the, uh, here is what we find. So what you see here is 
the, bi the, 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 the light distribution is the binomial distribution. If everybody is honest, that should, be, that should occur at the aggregate level, okay? Now what you also find is there, there are a few guys here who say 10 times, I have 10 times hats, okay? <laughs> Very unlikely, it's a kind of uh, above what should be expected. And you have here a few guys who shift in this direction, but overall this is the most honest distribution I've ever seen. These are the bankers in our sample. So uh, we have done this with many different kinds of subject pools. And I tell you, the bankers in the control condition, they are the most honest guys, contrary to, to widespread belief, okay? Now, now, what we did also is, we have this other condition, the professional prime condition. And what we find here, look, uh, there are quite a few more guys who say 10 times heads now, and 10 times eights is also very popular. Uh, so eight times heads is also very popular. And there is a clear shift in the distribution to the right, and if you look at aggregate uh, cheating rates, then the cheating rate is basically not significantly different from zero. So, and so the number of successful coin flips basically reported is this. And whereas in the, in the banker prime condition, we have many significantly more successful coin flips, suggesting uh, that there is a shift uh, in honesty. So one journalist said, bankers are honest unless they are reminded that, our bank, that they're bankers. Now, we have to keep in mind that, I mean, it has been used for very polemical arguments, this paper, but that's also why I point out that the bankers are the most honest population I have found. I mean, we have no representative banks here. We, we have to be careful. It's, it's a banking industry in, in, a, in one country. Um, it's, it's unclear to what extent we can generalize, but it kind of lines up with what many people believed. Uh, about what's, what's, what's gone wrong in parts of the banking industry. And from a scientific viewpoint, the nice thing is that it's very hard to, to assign uh, the change in honesty to anything else but a preference change. So we have several controls. I don't go into the details, but it's a, there's a, we know that people have a preference for honesty. We know that, okay? The economic man is not, is not what's, what's so if I do this experiment, you always get many, many people who are honest, okay? Many, many people. So if they would just be money maximizers, you would have all people 10 times 10, but that's not what you observe. Actually, it's surprisingly honest is when you, but the surprise is always relative to reference point, relative to what you would expect maybe when you have studied economics or finance. But uh, it's, uh, uh, Nevertheless, a shift in, in preferences. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the second study. Now let me come to, to an end. Uh, I make this very short. The example of Chernobyl and the pro-sociality case. The example of Chernobyl, I stumbled on this data because some people came to me and told me what they do and, and they, and I, this is a data treasure, what, 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 what was available here. The, the, the data look as follows. So we have uh, data on preference measures from the Ukrainian population. These are representative data. These preference measures have been taken in 203, 204, 205, 6, and so on. Uh, the Chernobyl accident was in 1986. And what we know is that in the vicinity of the nuclear power plant, there was severe damage, also health-related damage. Okay, so between three and five percent of the population are physically and in, in terms of health affected by, the, by this uh, accident. But the other 95 to 97 percent of the population that's known by now is, didn't basically get much noticeable radiation fallout. They, in terms of, you could express it in terms of annual background radiation, if you live a year longer, that's what most of the people experience. So they are, in terms of being exposed to back to radiation, they are as if they are a year older. So they, they consumed, so to speak, one additional year or 1.5 additional year of 
background radiation, which is nothing, which is, which is in terms of health consequences, it's really nothing, okay? And so we look at these people who have not been physically affected. We can, one can show that there are several articles. And the nice thing from a scientific viewpoint, Chernobyl accident is of course bad, but as a scientist, uh, you are looking for natural experiments and the weather condition randomly distributed the cloud over whole Ukraine. And that's what we can exploit. We have random variation of, uh, radi r random variation in radiation fallout and so this random variation helps us to identify the causal impact of radiation on preference measures. We have time risk preference measures, we have, a preference, we have measures about political preferences and what we find is that people who have been exposed to more natural background radiation, physically imperceptible na background radiation, they become more risk averse, they become more impatient, they become more politically conservative, they like the Soviet Union more, they like planned economies more, and so on. So it's pretty pervasive, the impact, and you, we ask ourselves, why does it happen? Because it's not a physical effect. And here is our preferred story why it happens. So these are just the measures where I show it concretely. Bas this quotation basically tells you implicitly the story. It's from, from Richard Wilson, a professor of physics at Harvard University, who said, the worst disease here in Ukraine is not radiation sickness. Except for children, the physical effects are not easy to measure. And actually we know for 95 to 97 percent of the population they are inexistent. The truth is that the fear of Chernobyl has done much more damage than Chernobyl itself. And the story that we tell with, based on data in the paper is as follows. The people who are more affected, cycle, let me put it differently, people who experience more background radiation, they observe more public signals of affectedness. What does a public signal mean? Well, the police is telling you you are not allowed to grow your own lettuce or whatever in your garden, okay? You have to swallow pills. Uh, uh, your children have to swallow pills. So there are many, many signs of public affectedness here that create the impression that you are affected, that you, you might have gotten something. And the, the problem is you, that radiation sickness is, is something that can break out in 20 years, you see. It's kind of this uneasy feeling, the fear, it mi there might be something in my body that might be dangerous for me. And we believe that it's this fear that generates higher risk aversion, higher discounting of the future, and more conservative political preferences. Third example. Very shortly, the final example uh, from Armin Falk. He did a randomized controlled trials to take socioeconomically disadvantaged kids, randomly assign half of them to a treatment condition, I tell in a minute what it is, and to a control condition, which means nothing is happening. And the treatment condition is this. You assign a pro-social caretaker to the child. The family has to agree. Uh, and the pro-social caretaker is typically may something like a 22-year-old student who uh, meets the child every week for an afternoon and is here for the child helps with homework, helps with homework, goes to the cinema, may go to the park. It's just a caretaker. The preferences of the child are the important thing. So the caretaker uh, tries to, to, to care for the child. And he measures social preferences, so their pro-sociality before and after. And what he finds is after a year of pro-social caretaking experience, the children become more altruistic, they trust more in strangers, and uh, uh, they are on average more pro-social. 
And what's very interesting is that in, in the socioeconomically disadvantaged families, on average, the mothers are pretty selfish and the children are selfish in the control group. So you have a strong intergenerational linkage. In the treatment group, after a year, the mother is still selfish, but the child is pro-social. And to the same degree, the pro-sociality is at the same level than pro-sociality in other social groups. So I find this a very stunning exp uh, experiment that shows you, yes, indeed, we can do pretty fundamental things when we take it seriously that preferences uh, are something that's malleable, that can be changed in the short and in the long run. Uh, we have additional policy tools available that we have to evaluate, and that all together brings me to an end. So I hope I have convinced you that preferences are an important object of scientific inquiry, that time risk and social preferences are shaped in important ways by, the so by social and economic factors, Factors, they are affected by asset prices, business culture, education. I didn't go into that, ethnics and other conflicts. So we have this increasing evidence that ethnic conflict, wars, and so on have impact on preferences. Uh, if preferences are endogenous, they can and sometimes probably should be targeted by economic and social policies. And so I conclude my my presentation with the gustibus est disputandum, we must quarrel about preferences, or with President Obama, we could say, yes, we can, and it's exciting. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk, um, bringing broad aspects of uh, social, uh, preferences. Um, we have now time for questions. Any question? You have one? Okay, let's start here. Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you say that um, the results of your research may suggest that you can um, um, have an influence on economic policy by affecting preferences. What about the ethical uh, implications of this? No, because somehow you also could like distort preferences in some favor of given type of policies or things like that. Are there ethical implications in in, in affecting preferences in, so, in some way or the other? Uh, let me say something on this. Uh, I have strongly argued that preferences are endogenous. Now, let me qualify that statement. Uh, if we knew the determinants of preferences fully, if we had a co complete picture, we could write down a model that takes all that into account. And if we had that model, I give you an example, let's assume that framing effects, how you present the problem, shifts preferences. If we would know how people respond to shifts in frames, we could put that into a model. And we would have a more general model that would again have as a basis something stable that could be called preference, but it's now a preference that's framing dependent. You see? In the end, once you would have a complete picture, you would, when, once you would have the true structural model behind the determinants of preferences, you would again end up with something stable, okay? That could be the measure against which to uh, evaluate policies that have these effects on intermediate preferences. So this is a fundamental issue here because preferences are always unstable relative to some model. And when I say they are not stable, what I typically mean is they are, they are not stable relative to our standard models that we use in economics. Okay, that's very important. Uh, to, to in, and in this sense, I 
the view can be reconciled with Becker and Stigler. You see? That's but at a, at a kind of different level then. And so, uh, it, and it solves the problem of um, social welfare because you would then make social welfare judgments based on the true structural underlying preferences that we are not yet able to, uh, we don't know yet. So it's a long research pro. It's basically, I believe that the science of preference formation could be one of the exciting next frontiers in the social sciences. Everything is here what we, what we, what we need. Causality, infer causal inferences, economists are the world champions in the social sciences to make in the, in the domain of causal inference from naturally occurring data. Experimental tools to measure preferences, everything is there. We just, you need just to do it. And you need just be entrepreneurial and collect the data and have, have uh, and then let's go. So there is a huge opportunity here, I believe, for, for progress uh, for the next two, th two or three decades. Other questions? Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you said that uh, banks are willing to change business culture. And how can we expect them to change when the possibility of being caught is so low? When, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really nervous, but <laughs> um, when, when, when there's private loss is being covered by at public expense, and when even if they get caught, the, if, if they actually go to jail or if, if they actually have to give back the money, uh, it's not um, proportional in any way to the amount that they have st stolen or made disappear or yeah so no very good question so uh, you are of course right I mean we cannot expect them to do this voluntarily and they you see but the banks are not a, the, the same bank in 2008 is not the same the, a bank in 2008 is not the same as a bank in 2015 for example there were cases in Citibank where one of the board members of Citibank uh, was uh, raising arguments ag against some of their business practices. What happened at the time, it, he was replaced. Now, uh, and with a, with a more uh, uh, opportunistic or, or uh, board member. Now, uh, the public pressure is therefore has been extremely important and public outrage was extremely important and is g going to be important to keep on uh, the pressure. But at the same time, what they also noticed is that in the long run, they, they don't benefit from, from questionable business practices. So for example, uh, let's say LIBOR, or, or le let's, let's say uh, so some of these scandals like the LIBOR scandal. If you look at the, at the at the, at the scale of the problem in terms of involved people, it's sometimes not a big number, which doesn't make it better for them, but view it from this perspective. Think of a city, any city in Spain with 60,000 people. How many potential criminals does this city have? Think of a company with 60,000 employees. How many potential criminals does the company have? So we have a compliance problem. And, uh, and uh, I believe that at the top, there is now a lot of insight that they want to solve the compliance problem, putting reputation first, because they fear the reputational loss. You could say this is a self-interested reason. Yes, but it's not wrong to do the right thing for self-interested reasons. So, so I think it, we ha the, the reputation loss is important that they incur. And it's the reputation loss that finally uh, brings them uh, on a road that, uh, that is better. But yes, if the public is not vigilant, uh, uh, they, may, they may stop their attempts. But I also want to point out that it's not easy to, 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 get to implement compliance in a large number of people in a bank with 200,000 employees. I mean, you just, you know you have a few guys who do the wrong thing, okay? 
And what about the country? I mean, let me take the bank. Well, let me take the wealth management example. Let's say a bank somewhere in Europe wants to go to Brazil. Now, I have my, some or to Latin America. My belief is there's a lot of tax evasion down there. My belief there's quite a lot of tax evasion. And now if you do wealth management, you get lots of untaxed money. Every bank takes untaxed money. What do you do in that market? It takes quite some courage to say, no, we don't. We go for the, the, the sober money because in the long run, we, that's the right strategy, of course. But it's, the temptation for them was pretty big or is pretty big to also take untaxed money. And, and then public opinion sometimes shifts. There are these radical shifts in public opinion. Right now in some Latin American countries, let's say, uh, there's anti-corruption fight, fights going on, which is good, but then it may, everything may shift. It may turn things on, on its head. So I'm thinking it, the world is more complicated. They are not all just bad guys. I, I, they, they are following their own interests, which in the re relevant environment may well be improve uh, reputation of their organizations. Yeah. <coughs> Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you um, <laughs> Professor Fair. Again. So after the question round, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I thank our distinguished guest today, Professor Fair. That was a very, I think we learned a lot today. Uh, thanks again to our sponsor, Laboratories Dr. Esteve. So uh, finally, on behalf of the rector, the president of the university, uh, I say this in Gataran, declaro oficialmente inaugurat al curs 2015-2016. Bon dia y bona.